Uh, good morning, and well, welcome to First Baptist Church on this lovely, rainy morning. I guess we needed more rain. I don't know. But anyway, um, announcements. On Monday, the Uplift Cancer Support Group will meet at the church at 3 p.m. On Tuesday, Pastor Rebecca will be at Charlie's Coffee House studying from 9 to noon, and feel free to drop by if you would like to visit. On Friday, we plan to offer hospitality to our community for the Street Fest between 5.30 and 9. I hope it doesn't rain. If you would like to donate watermelon, cups, forks, please talk to Ken or Teresa Taylor. They would also appreciate knowing if you're planning to help with chairs or greeting. And if you have a new or gently used Bible that you would like to contribute, that would also be welcome. On Saturday, Sue Mellon is inviting everyone to her farm for a Holy Spirit hoedown. Uh, upcoming opportunities. There is a family of four who has recently come to Vermont from Haiti and is interested in attending worship services with us. If you would be interested in helping with transportation to church, please let Pastor Rebecca know. Uh, there's a church picnic planned for Saturday, August 17th at the Manchester Rec Park, Pavilion 1, from 4 to 7 p.m. And August's Holy Hike will be at the Equinox Preserve on Saturday, the 24th, at 9 a.m. Happy birthday to Chloe Russell today. Happy birthday to Jim Lincoln on Tuesday. And happy anniversary to Jerry and Linnell Pike on Wednesday. And thank you to Linda Hewlett for flowers today in loving memory of her husband, Butch Hewlett. Um, the word of preparation is a poem called Faith by Edgar Guest. Um, probably most of you have heard of Edgar Guest. He was poet laureate in Michigan. And in his lifetime, he wrote over 11,000 poems, which boggles my mind. I believe in the world and its bigness and splendor that most of the hearts beating round us are tender, that days are but footsteps and years are but miles that lead us to beauty and singing and smiles, that roses that blossom and toilers that plod are filled with the glorious spirit of God. I believe in the purpose of everything living, that taking is but the forerunner of giving, that strangers are friends that we someday may meet, and not all the bitter can equal the sweet, that creeds are but colors, and no man has said that God loves the yellow rose more than the red. I believe in the path that today I am treading, that I shall come safe through the dangers I'm dreading, that even the scoffer shall turn from his ways and someday be won back to trust and to praise, that the leaf on the tree and the thing we call man are sharing alike in his infinite plan. I believe that all things that are living and breathing some richness of beauty to earth are bequeathing, that all that goes out of this world leaves behind some duty accomplished for mortals to find, that the humblest of creatures our praise is deserving, for it, with the wisest, the master is serving. Oh 
to worship uh, is Psalm 46. Please join in reading the bold lines. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress.
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
not delay my refuge and strength away. I will not fear His promise is true. My God will come through always, always. And oh, my God, He will not delay my refuge and strength always. Always. Well, if you have been here for other messages on this series from the Minor Prophets, you have already learned some things about Nineveh. It is the huge city in Assyria, which is modern-day Iraq, where God called Jonah to go and give his message of warning. And the people of Nineveh took Jonah's message very seriously. They humbled themselves, they fasted from food and water, they dressed in sackcloth, and the Lord responded by pouring out grace and mercy on them, holding back the destruction that was coming. Well, a hundred years has passed since that time, and many of the people of Assyria, and especially their leaders, have sadly returned to their wicked and heartless ways. In 700 BC, King Sennacherib made Nineveh Assyria's capital, and it was a massive, luxurious, and proud city. It boasted the world's first aqueduct, using tributaries of the Tigris River. Nineveh's walls that were 100 feet tall at the town of Jonah are now surrounded by a moat of 150 feet wide. And the people of Assyria worshipped an idol named Ishtar, goddess of fertility and war. There was a large temple in Nineveh dedicated to her. Nineveh was filled with treasures that had been amassed from 200 years of conquering and pillaging other nations. One of those nations, as you heard last week, was Israel. The northern kingdom of Israel had been crushed by Assyria. Their treasures taken and their people deported to try to wipe out their national identity. The southern kingdom of Judah had had mo many of its um, cities attacked, as well as the silver and gold from the temple stripped and given to Assyria to, to keep them from sacking Jerusalem, but that wasn't going to be enough. And you remember King Hezekiah humbly spread that threatening letter from Assyria before the Lord and asked for mercy and deliverance. And God sent an angel to defend them from the Assyrian army. King Sennacherib fled back to Nineveh in fear after losing 185,000 fighters in a single night to the, that death angel. Yet, Assyria remained a threat and an oppressive enemy. Nobody thought that Nineveh would ever fall. The people all thought it was too big to fail. Nonetheless, God told Nahum that Nineveh would fall. The accumulated sins of 200 years would receive their due consequences. It was dangerous for Nahum to spread this message from God. If the king of Assyria heard his message, Nahum would be surely killed. Still, Nahum chose to speak truth to power. And as we hear Nahum's message this morning, we're going to come face to face with God's wrath. Yet, Nahum's name actually means comfort. For Judah, Nahum's prophetic message was comforting. They needed to know that God would hold Assyria accountable for all its wrongs to protect them from further aggression and oppression through Assyria. This is the God of justice that we hear speaking through Nahum. Some people like to edit this part of God away, emphasizing only God's love and forgiveness. Yet God's anger with sin remains. So this morning, 
we have a chance to grapple with God's sovereignty in dealing with both individuals and whole nations. I think you might agree that this world is full of trouble, but in the midst of all, we can still find our safe place of comfort in God. This is Nahum chapter one. This is the vision God gave to Nahum, who lived in Elkosh, concerning the impending doom of Nineveh. God is jealous over those he loves. That is why he takes vengeance on those who hurt them. He furiously destroys their enemies. He is slow in getting angry, but when aroused, his power is incredible and he does not easily forgive. He shows his power in the terrors of the cyclone and the raging storms. Clouds are billowing dust beneath his feet. At his command, the oceans and rivers become dry sand. The lush pastures of Bashan and Carmel fade away. The green forests of Lebanon wilt. In his presence, mountains quake and hills melt. The earth crumbles and its people are destroyed. Who can stand before an angry God? His fury is like fire. The mountains tumble down before his anger. The Lord is good. When trouble comes, he is the place to go, and he knows everyone who trusts in him. But he sweeps away his enemies with an overwhelming flood. He pursues them all night long. What are you thinking of, Nineveh, to defy the Lord? He will stop you with one blow. He won't need to strike again. He tosses his enemies into the fire like a tangled mass of thorns. They burst into flames like straw. Who is this king of yours who dares to plot against the Lord? But the Lord is not afraid of him. Though he build his army millions strong, the Lord declares, it will vanish. O oh, my people, I have punished you enough. Now I will break your chains and release you from the yoke of slavery to this Assyrian king. And to the king he says, I have ordered an end to your dynasty. Your sons will never sit upon your throne and I will destroy your gods and temples, and I will bury you, for how you stink with sin. See, the messengers come running down the mountains with glad news. The invaders have been wiped out, and we are safe. O Judah, proclaim a day of thanksgiving, and worship only the Lord, as you have vowed. For this enemy from Nineveh will never come again. He is cut off forever. He will never be seen again. Quite a passage, right? <laughs> I can't say I was looking forward to look, um, preaching on Nahum, but there's always something, a message from the Lord for us, so let's listen and find out. In Claudia Barba's book about the minor prophets, entitled Sovereign Hope, she entitled, titled the section on Nahum, God's judgment may be slow, but it is sure. The judgment that God pronounced over Nineveh at the time of Jonah was deferred by their repentance. Do you remember how angry Jonah was about that? He kind of pouted and wanted to die because God showed mercy on them. But over time, their humility gave way to pride again. Their acknowledgement of God faded into deep disrespect and they attacked God's people. So the wrath of God was stirred up against them. Nahum 1, 2 says, God is jealous over those he loves. That is why he takes vengeance on those who hurt them. Does this description seem contrary to how God revealed his character through Jesus in the New Testament? It might leave you feeling kind of confused. How can God be good if he's jealous and takes vengeance? We're not supposed to do that. But to help us understand what is being said here, we need to understand what the word jealousy means in Hebrew and if it can have a positive connotation. It is the Hebrew word kano. God has given humanity life, as well as provision to sustain life and instructions to help all of humanity and earth to flourish. And in return, God is to be acknowledged with gratitude and honor, and God's instructions followed with humility and love. 
This is the life of worshiping the living God, who is our creator and sustainer. When humanity refuses to do this, God becomes jealous and angry. The relationship that we were designed to have with God is unrealized, and other unhealthy relationships take that sacred space. The Bible consistently calls this idolatry, and many sinful attitudes and actions flow out of this misdirected worship, because we are created to worship. God's response is, Kano, this is not right. The love that is meant to flow exclusively between humanity and our creator gets bent away from God, and it feels like adultery feels in a marriage from God's perspective. The relationship is broken, and God is rightly hurt and angry. Each time a people group chooses idolatry over relationship with the living God, they also diminish the chance of others knowing God. They obscure the truth and diminish God's glory. It's a serious problem, and God does not take it lightly. If we turn to the Psalms, we hear what the Hebrews learned about God, what they know about him, and his response to humanity when we break relationship. It is you alone who are to be feared. Who can stand before you when you are angry? From heaven you pronounced judgment, and all the land feared and was quiet. When you, God, rose up to judge, to save all the afflicted of the land. So this psalm describes God's jealousy and how God goes about taking vengeance. God's vengeance is not an impetuous outburst with the aim of hurting the person or people group who hurt people that God loves. It is actually a purposeful act of judgment that brings things back into balance. It's a restoration of respect and quietness for the earth, and it's a rescue for the ones being afflicted. Have you heard, vengeance belongs to the Lord? That is a truth that runs throughout scripture from Deuteronomy to Revelation. I'll read one verse from the New Testament that brings those two Old and New Testament together. Because Romans 12, 19 quotes Deuteronomy 32, 35. Do not avenge yourselves, dear friends, but give place to God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I found an article entitled, Three Encouraging Reasons We Should Let Vengeance Be the Lord's. It's written by someone named Clarence Haynes, Jr. And he writes, The Lord always has the bigger picture in mind. God is the only one who can exact revenge and show mercy at the same time. When God brings vengeance, his heart is not just to get back at people. He is executing justice. Whenever God would bring judgment on a people, it is because their sin had reached a point where he could no longer hold it back. It is a reality of a God who is just. Basically, the seeds that the nation had been planting for many years, for centuries, were coming into the time of harvesting the consequences of those actions. For Nineveh, for Assyria, they had brutalized nations around them for 200 years. And those nations were angry, and they were going to rise up and throw off that oppression. Well, the message from the Lord that Nahum gave to Judah and the people of Nineveh was very specific about what would happen to this proud and defiant city. They were trusting in their ability to control water for their own purposes, forgetting that life-giving water is always a gift from God. Verse 4 mentions that at God's command, the rivers become dry sand. And then verse 8 says, he sweeps his enemies away with an overwhelming flood. Well, how are both of those things going to happen? They seem contradictory, right? Guess what? 
612 BC, an army of Medes and Babylonians stopped the flow of water into Nineveh by building a big dam. And then heavy rains came and they released that pent up water in such a way it damaged those mighty walls of Nineveh and gave them access to invade. In verse 14, God said to Nineveh's king, I have ordered an end to your dynasty. Your sons will never sit upon your throne and I will destroy your gods and temples and I will bury you. And in chapter 3, verses 13 and 15, it says, The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has consumed the bars of your gates. The fire will consume you. Well, when the Assyrian king saw that his defeat was imminent, he actually set fire to his own palace and perished in the flames. God's message to Nahum came to pass. Nineveh was totally destroyed, never to be rebuilt. The desert sands buried Nineveh, and it was only discovered by archaeologists in the 1840s. Even then, it's just ruins still, and they're in a territory of war, kind of near Mosul, Iraq. Claudia Barbara writes, what an end for a city that thought it would endure forever. The violence and tragedy Assyria had spread to the world now came back to engulf them. Does God have a right to judge the Assyrians? Scripture says yes, he does. God is not a human. God is the one who does have the right to make judgments. And God can defend what rightfully belongs to him. On our deck, I have a box where I grow herbs, and this year I added some cherry tomato plants. And I was happily gathering the red ones when I noticed that several tomatoes were half eaten. On closer inspection, some of the leaves were also munched up. So I began looking through the branches to see what was eating my tomatoes. And sure enough, I found some hornworms. They might have thought that the tomatoes were theirs for the taking and that they were the masters of the garden box. But I decided that Judgment Day had come for them and I flung them out into the yard. That was their merciful judgment. I'm waiting to see if they retaliate and come back. If they persist in taking what is not rightfully theirs, a harsher judgment will befall them. We need to remember that we are not God. This is God's world, and we are blessed to be here at all. God expects us to live within the creative order with a healthy respect for our creator. The amazing thing is that God loves us at all, that God is patient and caring and wants what is best for each one of us and for all of humanity. Even when judgments are necessary and the consequences for our behavior come home to roost, God is always ready to extend mercy and forgiveness. When you think about our world as it is today and the nations in it, what do you think God sees? What does he think when he looks at individual nations and the relations between them? What does God think about North Korea or Russia? Or what's happening to Christians in Nigeria? What does he see in Israel or Iran or Haiti or the United States? God cares about what is happening in all of these countries and every country is accountable to God for its actions and attitudes. And the effect is having both on its own people and on relationships in the world. We, like Judah, can take comfort that God's justice will prevail in the areas that concern us. It may take a long time. We may wonder, what are you waiting for, God? But maybe we should also think about God's patience and mercy with our own country. Is our country in a good relationship with the Lord? You might want to spend some time holding that question before the Lord. 
And if God brings sins to your mind that our country as a whole is committing, you can confess them because we are part of this country. And if those sins are personal, that we find ourselves doing them, we should confess those as well and ask God to change our hearts. When I did this, I confessed our country's violence, our history of exploitation, of stealing treasures that did not belong to us, of pride and idolatry. We need to have a humble spirit. We need to own that we are part of this country and pray for our country, not just judge it. This invites God's mercy, and that is something that we all need. So if you read the three chapters of Nahum, you will find much to, to read on the warning front. One of the commentaries said, if you want a short book on God's judgment, this is the one <laughs> to read. But if we look closely, we can also find a word of encouragement. In verse 7, it says, The Lord is good. When trouble comes, he is the place to go, and he knows everyone who trusts in him. Some translations use the word stronghold, where the, the Living Bible says the place to go. God is our safe place, our fortress, our harbor in the storm. God will welcome us into his arms of protection even when the world is a very troubled place because of either natural disasters or human-made ones. In the time Nahum was written, the whole book was a word of comfort to Judah, who saw their oppressor powerfully defeated without even needing to fight them at all. And when we rely on the Lord, trusting in his plan as revealed in his word, we can receive comfort and perspective as we see God's sovereignty on display. It often takes much longer for justice to come than we would expect, but it does come. We need to realize that God is patient, extending many chances for mercy to everyone because God wants all people everywhere to repent and turn to him. But while we wait, we can rest in God, our safe place, our stronghold. The imagery in the song that Lisa and I sang as the prelude pictured sinking below the troubled waves on the surface of the water during the storm. We might feel like we're sinking sometimes, but it can actually be God's mercy pulling us deeper into communion with him. Anne Vaskamp was one of the songwriters for the song Anchor, and she also wrote about going deep in her blog this week, entitled Olympics and Headlines and Fraught Times, How to Move Through These Days. She mentioned a swimmer named Leon Marchand, who swam two races on Wednesday night, becoming the first person to win gold in the 200 meter butterfly and breaststroke in the same Olympics. He had learned to stay underwater as much as possible, escaping the waves of the surface. Anne writes, this is not true only for swimming. It's true of fraught times and charged days and contentious rhetoric and conflicting perspectives. What happens under the surface is what ultimately will overcome. What decides the race of life is the inner life. When the intensity of things goes higher is when we get deeper. If you're tired of the drag of things, go deeper. Go deeper into prayer, deeper into the word, deeper into silence and solitude and the spirit, deeper into connecting with God and people. God is our harbor. He is our helper. Well, before we leave Nahum, I also want to show you a verse that points to Christ. It is chapter 1, verse 15, and I think you can recognize it a little more clearly in the New Life version. See, on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news and speaks of peace. Keep your special suppers, O Judah. Keep your promises. For the sinful one will never come against you again. 
he is destroyed. The proclamation of peace was first fulfilled when Assyria was routed in 612 BC, yet it was fulfilled more fully when Jesus Christ came to proclaim peace and good news six centuries later. Jesus is the one who defeated Satan, the ultimate oppressor of our souls. And this is what we celebrate when we come to our table of communion. Jesus came to bring us into right relationship with our Creator God, to show us the way to embrace God's mercy and forgiveness, and to find our safe place in Him, both now, during the troubles of life, and also for eternity. So Nahum's prophecy concerning Nineveh still has relevance for us today. It gives us an opportunity to see God's sovereignty on display and to recognize the importance of humility and right relationship with God on both a national and personal level. And we have the invitation to trust God in the midst of turbulent times, to go to him believing he is good and that he knows us and that God will be our place of refuge. And finally, we give thanks for Jesus, who, like Nahum, was not afraid to stand up and speak truth to power. Jesus felt the fury of the earthly power, who was motivated by the evil one. But even in his death, Jesus won the victory. So let us live in the shelter that Jesus has won for us, keeping our hearts pure and our trust centered on the Lord. And no matter what we see in the world, remember, God is stronger. Let's pray as we get ready to receive communion. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has the right to judge us, yet is so patient in extending the chance for mercy. We thank you for sending us prophets to help you see your perspective of humanity, and most of all for sending Jesus, your son, to open the way for us to be forgiven and whole and safe in your presence. Help us to go deep with you when the surface of our life is troubled by all the waves of turmoil in this world, so that we may live for your glory and experience your victory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Broken for you. 
In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Just remembering Christ's blood shed for you. Would you bow in prayer with me once more? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for taking on the ultimate bully of our souls and for giving your life to save ours. We are so glad that you rose again on the third day and that you're preparing a place for us to be with you one day. May we keep our eyes on you, looking forward to your coming, and find our safe place with you now and forever. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Spirit's power filled you, hear His tender comfort stilled you. Go, my children, fed and nourished, joyful and free. Amen. Go in peace.